Okay, I think we are live. Oh, look, recording my coverage is not live. I'm guessing my phone tells me when <clears throat> I'm alive, when I'm live. Because I feel like every time I come on here to do a video or something, I feel like Facebook keeps changing something around. Um, so, because I don't do these that much, I'm, I'm kind of a, um, <clears throat> kind of adopting or you know adapting to it uh, every time that I do a, a new video. Um, so basically, I had a little bit of time on my hands tonight. We had some plans fall through. So I thought I would take advantage of this downtime to talk a little bit about the gospel. I've been thinking about a scripture lately. I'm not going to really cover it, but let, let me read it to you guys. It's from Galatians 1.6. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. So this prompted me to want to, uh, to, give, to make this video. Um, so let me read that verse and I'll... I'll get into it. So this is Galatians 1.6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul was dealing with the Galatians, and they were dealing with the group that was called the Judaizers, which were you know, kind of trying to take the church back to the Jewish roots, back to certain you know, aspects of the Jewish law, circumcision, maybe the ceremonies and all that kind of stuff. And Paul was insisting that, you know, that that stuff's not the gospel. Jesus Christ is the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith and faith alone, that's the biblical gospel. So that's why Paul wrote Galatians. But just that idea right there that you're believing a different gospel and how that can have some serious effects psychologically, and in the long run, you know, eternally, it's going to have obviously negative effects because believing a different gospel, believing a false gospel, well, is not going to uh, allow you to inherit eternal life. So that's why I wanted to do this because I've heard stories of people, you know, turning to the Mormon church, going back to, you know, Roman Catholicism and all these false religions. Um, so I wanted to, to do what I do and give this Bible teaching because at the end of the day, you know, anything that Reformed and Recovered does, we are gospel-centered. We are Bible-centered. So we want to always direct people back to the Bible, what the Bible teaches on the person of Jesus Christ, and what the Bible teaches about the path of salvation. How do we get saved? What do we need to get saved from? We want to approach those things um, from the Bible, not just from sentiment or, uh, you know, the denomination that we might belong to or the type of theology that we're into, but we want to approach all these questions from the pages of the Bible. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to get into this statement about sin and salvation. And it's quite a few pages long. So I might stop in the middle, uh, but I might, I might just keep going. So this is a statement about sin and salvation, which is basically a statement of what Reformed and Recovered believes is the biblical gospel. And excuse me while I fan myself because it's a little bit hot over here in my apartment. So this is a statement about sin and salvation. I'm going to start off by reading Romans 3, uh, 23 to 24. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. And also, of course, Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then I got a little quote for you guys here from Frank Buckman. If you don't know who Buckman is, he's the with the founder of the Oxford group or what later became known as moral rearmament. This is a quote that I've always enjoyed. It says that sin is the disease, Christ is the cure, the result is a miracle. Christ is the cure, the result is a miracle. Okay, on sin. So mankind has a sin problem. Let me say that again. Mankind has a sin problem. You could even call us sin addicts. We couldn't stop sinning even if we wanted to. Our hearts and minds are warped and bent in the direction of sin. As a people, we are inclined to sin. It's in our very nature. On our own, we run from the will of God, not towards it. Why do I believe this? Well, just, just look at the world, right? Look at the crazy world. Look at the greed. Look at the chaos, the rape, the theft, the drunkenness, the poverty, the murder, the disobedience, and the ill will. Everywhere you look, you see corruption and evil and mischief and injustice. There's corruption in our institutions and in our businesses and in our homes because it's inside of us and it's in our hearts and our minds. Human humanity, despite all the good we've accomplished, 
is sinful and cured. Go to the court. I believe that everybody sins because I see it and I do it every day. But more importantly, because the Bible tells me so. The Bible is God's perfect word to mankind for ethics and morals. What it says, I fully embrace. I even embrace the sections which offend my pride or my modern sensibilities. The Bible has shaped my worldview and it determines my view of sin. So the Bible shaped my personal worldview and shapes the worldview that Reform and Recovered promotes as a ministry and as an organization. In Romans 3.23, the Bible plainly says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. With this passage, the first thing to point is that, out is that all means all, all right? This means that all have sinned and continue to sin. This means that the young have sinned and that the old have sinned. The rich have sinned and the poor have sinned. The influential have sinned and the oppressed have sinned. Males have sinned and females have sinned. All are sinners who sin on a regular basis. Our social, racial, and economic status does not change this one bit. Everybody is a sinner. Everyone sins. All have sinned means that everybody has sinned or missed the mark, as the Greek implies. The question is, whose mark? If we've missed the mark, what mark? Whose mark? Whose mark have we all missed? We've missed God's mark, okay? We've missed God's mark. All of us have fallen short of God's mark, which is his standard for love and obedience, okay? This means that you and I have not loved or live, or we have not loved or lived how God has desired for us to live. We have violated what is known as God's moral law by sinning and sin is lawlessness. That's 1 John 3, 4. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is to break the moral law of God. So what do I mean by the term moral law? Simply put, the moral law is a, it's a basic statement of how God desires for us to act towards him and our neighbors. The Bible tells us that we are to obey and believe in God with all of our heart and mind. It also tells us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. This is the moral law in its most basic form. The moral law is formally presented in the form of the Ten Commandments. Um, you guys can check out Exodus 20 for that. You can also see my booklet, God's Ten Words, the Ten Commandments as a tool for personal moral inventory, where I get into that. It's available on Amazon. I get into that. Um, we're also turning that into a discussion book. So the first is more for like devotional use. And now we've uh, switched it up for uh, for group use. If you're interested in studying and discussing the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, it's very important to reform and recover. So the, the Ten Commandments, the moral law is kind of formalized or presented in the form of the Ten Commandments. But it's also written on our hearts and consciences, right? The work of the law is written on our hearts. That's Romans 2.15. This tells us that we all instinctively know what God expects from us. Even more so, we instinctively know who God is and what he expects of us. Okay, We instinctively know who God is and what he expects from us. Yet, in our rebellion, we reject and suppress the perfect will of God. By following the desires of our corrupt natures, this is sin, right? This is lawlessness. All of us, no matter who we are, are guilty of violating God's moral law. When we curse the name of God, we violate his law. When we seek satisfaction of solace in, lesser, in a lesser power, we violate the law of God. When we lie, we violate God's law. When we cheat or steal, we violate God's law. When we yell at our parents, we violate God's law. When we abuse alcohol and sleep around, we violate God's law. All of these acts, big or small, are wrong in the eyes of God. And all of these acts are lawlessness. Again, 1 John 3, 4. All of these things are lawlessness and many, 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 many other things. That's just some of the stuff off the top of my head. Next, it's important to note that we have earned what we have earned and deserve because of our sins. Right? So what have we earned and what do we deserve because 
of our sins. But Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin are death. So you and I, though through our constant disobedience, have earned or merited nothing but death. Because of our sins, we are spiritually dead. Someday we will physically die as a result of sin entering into the world. But until then, we are spiritually dead apart from the biblical Jesus Christ. Okay? In sinning, we are dead, and in dying, we will surely die. And that's the point in Genesis 2, 17. In sinning, we are dead, and in dying, we will surely die. To make matters worse, the death that we have earned through our constant disobedience, not only spiritual and eventually physical, but it's also eternal. This means that it's never ending. On our own, apart from Jesus Christ, we have earned everlasting death. In sinning, we are dead, and in dying, we will surely die for all of eternity. So our sin has not only earned us physical, spiritual, and eternal death. It has also made us enemies of God. We are enemies of God. Romans 5.10 As enemies of God, we deserve his just wrath. I say just wrath because that is what we have rightly earned through the negative choices we have made. Okay, We have earned the just wrath of God. There is no neutrality in life. And there are consequences for our decisions in time and eternity. We are the ones who have willfully and joyfully broken God's moral law, and we alone are guilty of the choices we have made. He will judge everyone, quote, he will judge everyone according to what they have done. Romans 2 6. Christ himself spoke of this in the gospel, right? Even Christ spoke of these things. Whoever believe, quote, whoever believes in the Son of God in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains upon him. Let me read it again. I'll explain it. Whoever believes in the Son, right? That's the biblical Jesus Christ, not the Mormon Jesus Christ, not any of these other little cults and shoot-offs. Whoever believes in the biblical Jesus Christ has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains. So in rejecting the will of God, we have made ourselves his enemies, and we deserve nothing but his wrath. Quote, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's Colossians 1.21. Quote, all of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's Ephesians 2, 3. Another quote, your iniquities have separated you from God. Okay, <laughs> Your iniquities have separated you from God. Sin is serious. That's Isaiah 59, 2a. And in case you think you're an exception to this teaching, you know, here is a list of common sins, which clearly tell us that we are all deserving death because of our action towards God and even our fellow, but most, most importantly through God. Here's a long quote. This is Romans 1, 29 and 32. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So I'm going to read it again. That's the key there. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. That whole list right there. Those who do that deserve death. If you've broken those laws, if you've done those things, you deserve death. But we continue to do it. We continue to do those very things, but also approve of those 
who practice them, right? So it's not enough to sin. We need to go out and you know make sin on a national level. We need to go out and make it legal, make sin legal, make these things legal. We go out there and promote these things and we approve of these things. So do you see yourself in this list, right? If you're honest, you should. I know I do. I see myself all over that list. I, like you, am deserving of wrath and death for the sins that I have committed. So I want to get on to the salvation. I don't want to dwell on the, on the sin and the death and the wrath and what's there. I don't want to dwell on it too much. So let me get on to the salvation. You know, I'm just going to run with this whole thing. There's really no reason not. Let me just summarize what we've talked about so far. So basically we said that mankind has a sin problem, right? A sin is a violation of God's moral law. A sin is lawlessness. The moral law teaches us, right? We violated the moral law, and the moral law teaches us how to rightly relate to God and our fellows. Because of our sins, we have earned eternal, we have earned spiritual, physical, and eternal death. And our sins have made us enemies of God, deserving his wrath. We are deserving of God's wrath. We're not going to get something that we don't deserve. We are deserving of God's wrath because of the choices we've made and the things that we've done. Because we've violated the moral law time and time again. All right, let's get on to salvation. Mankind has a sin problem, right? There is that. Thus, mankind needs a savior. Because we are sinful by nature, we need a sinless Savior. Jesus Christ is that Savior. He is the only hope for mankind. Outside of him, there is no chance of salvation. Scripture is emphatic about this. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other, there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which he must be saved. That's the true biblical Jesus Christ. While Romans 6.23 helps us to see that we deserve death because of our sins, Romans 6.23b, right, we can get to the positive side of this, teaches us about our great salvation. Let's look at this passage again to see this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just as death is associated with sin, eternal life is linked with Jesus Christ, with the true biblical Jesus Christ. Not some other Christ, but the true biblical Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23b first tells us that eternal life is a gift of God. This implies that salvation is by grace because grace is a gift. It's a gift that has been given graciously. Okay? It cannot be earned or merited. We don't earn salvation. We don't, we don't go, we don't go to heaven. We don't have you know, eternal life because of anything that we've done. It's a gift that has been graciously given. It cannot be earned or merited. God gives this gift to mankind out of the kindness of his heart. Okay? Without this gift, there is no hope for salvation. There is only wrath and death. Only hopelessness and condemnation, apart from this gift of God's grace. The scriptures tell us time and time again that we are saved by grace and grace alone. Quote, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Right? That's Ephesians 2.8. We all know that. Salvation is something we can never earn. Try as we might, it just won't happen. And we probably will. We're probably going to try but it will never, ever happen. It is also something that we do not deserve, right? You do not deserve a gift. A gift is given through the kindness of a giver. If a gift were earned, it would be a wage, not a gift. And that would go against what that text just says. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not something you can earn. When it comes to grace, we know that it's a gift. It's a gift that has been graciously given out of the kindness of the giver. The Bible tells us that God is the ultimate giver. He is the ultimate giver because he is love. 
because God is love and loves his creation. He gives them good and perfect gifts. Salvation is the ultimate gift, the ultimate expression of God's love, right? Think for God so loved, for God so loved that he gave. Think, sorry, John 3, 16a. For God so loved that he gave. It was because he so loved that he gave. Salvation is by grace, and grace is a gift freely given by God. Just as gifts are given, gifts must also be accepted. Because God loves us, he gives us the ability to receive his love. On our own, we cannot accept it. If he didn't give us the gift and give us the ability to receive the gift, we would not receive it. On our own, we cannot and we do not accept it. We receive his love and kindness through faith. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is the gift of God. Right? You see that there? By grace we have been saved through faith, and this is the gift of God. The grace and the faith is the gift of God. So God gives us the gift of salvation. He also gives us the ability to accept this gift. This is to remind us that salvation from beginning to end is all of grace. We don't earn a sliver of it. If God does not give us faith, we will not believe. We will remain in a state of death, and we wouldn't know any better. We wouldn't really mind. We wouldn't really know any better. Because we are by nature willing slaves of sin. Don't forget that. We are by nature willing sin, willing slaves of sin. We love our sin more than we love Christ. Now we're going to spend a couple minutes looking at Romans 5, 6 here. When talking about salvation, we can never overemphasize the fact of God's love. Okay? In case I get accused of hell, fire, and brimstone or anything like that, we can never get away from God's love. We can also no, never overemphasize our unworthiness, right? I, mean, I have a friend, me and him always joke, we're not worthy. We're not worthy when we talk about these things because we're not worthy. If God hadn't saved us and chosen to pull us from the darkness of our lives, we would still be in the darkness of our lives. Probably just living it up, loving it. So we can never overemphasize our unworthiness. In focusing on God's love and our unworthiness, we can more fully see the greatness of our salvation. And we can best see this in Romans 5, 6. Quote, at just the right time, and when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans 5, 6, or from Romans 5, 6, we can see that Christ died for our sins at just the right time. Christ's death and resurrection were not a fluke. It was all a part of God's perfect plan for salvation. Christ came, died, and rose again according to the will and timing of God. Everything happens according to his will, even our salvation. In this, God receives full glory. Ephesians 2, 9, you guys can look that up. Romans 5, 6 says, When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. From this text, we can see that we are by nature powerless and ungodly. We are entirely unlike God, who is all-powerful and glorious. You and I are unworthy. We are inherently weak. We, are, we have nothing to commend us to God. We are unworthy, but he is all-worthy. If he did not decide to grace us with his loving salvation, we would not be saved. We are human beings, and that's all we're ever going to be. Never going to be gods. We're never going to be more than that. We're human beings. We're going to be glorified someday. We will never be gods. We will never be gods. Romans 5 6 tells us that Christ died for the ungodly. That's us. When the text says for the ungodly, we can read this as in the place of the ungodly. This means that God displays his love for humanity by sending his son to die in our actual place. He died in our actual place place. This means that God displays his love for humanity by sending his son to die in our actual place. I might have repeated that. Because we are sinful by nature and deserve death and wrath, Christ suffered those things for us. 
okay? The punishment of death and wrath that was rightfully ours because of our earthly rebellion fell upon Christ. He suffered and died for our sins and the punishment that we had incurred, okay? Let me read that again because that's this is important stuff right here. The punishment of death and wrath that was rightfully ours because of our earthly rebellion fell upon Christ. He suffered and died for our sins and the punishment that we had incurred. So I had a footnote here. I'll read it to you guys. So in theology, I was trying to avoid these kind of theological terms because not everyone's that comfortable with them or whatever. But, you know, in theology, this is known as the substitutionary atonement. Okay. Which means that Christ died in our place to appease the just wrath of God. So in other words, Christ died to save us from God, right? Christ dies to save us, not from ourselves, like some people want to say, from our bad choices and all that kind of stuff, but to save us from the wrath of God, the just wrath of God that we had incurred because of our sins. Christ dies to save us from the wrath of God. Christ did what we could never do. So Christ was perfectly obedient. While you and I are sinful, Christ lived a perfect life. He was entirely righteous. This means that he never once violated the moral law. He never did anything deserving of death. He lived a perfect life in every sense of the word. Upon believing in Christ, his perfect righteousness, right? His per perfect righteousness is transferred to our accounts and our unrighteousness is transferred to him, okay? So when we believe the perfect righteousness of Christ comes to us and our unrighteousness is transferred to Christ. Through faith, we receive his, res his righteousness and he receives the punishment for our sins, which he paid for in full upon the cross, okay? This is the most important stuff right here. Upon believing in Christ, his perfect righteousness is transferred to our accounts, and our unrighteousness is transferred to him. This is justification by faith, guys. This is sola fide. Through faith, we have received the righteous. We have received his righteousness, and he receives the punishments for our sin, which was paid for in full upon the cross. Our sins, for those who believe, have been paid for in full upon the cross. Nothing more done. It's finished. There's nothing more we can add to it. Salvation is perfect. Christ has paid for the sins of his church. Here's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. This helps us see it. God made him, right? That's Christ. God made Christ who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God made Christ who had no sin to be sin for us, meaning he was put in our place to take our sins, to take our punishment, to pay for our sins and our punishments. So that in him, in Christ, through Christ, by faith, by grace, through faith, we might become the righteousness of God. So on the cross, Christ paid for our sins, and through faith, we receive his perfect righteousness. I got some footnotes here, but we're not going to go with that. Isaiah 53, 5 says that he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. This means that by grace through faith, we can become friends of God rather than enemies. We can have actual peace with God and not hostility. Because of Christ dying in our place, we can have and we can begin to live for the will of God and not ours alone. Which brings us back to Romans 6, 23b. That the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 
Now we're going to look at eternal life. All right? From Romans 6, 23b. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this is eternal life explained. And we're just going to keep going. So in Christ, we are given a new life. So in, in you know, theology, this is known as the new birth or regeneration. You want to look that up, John 3, Titus 3. You guys can go check that out later on. So we're given a new life, one which is far superior to our prior way of living. Okay. So we're given not only new life, but we're also given a real and true life prior to our conversions. We were dead in our lawlessness and our sins, right? Ephesians 2, I'm stressing that. We were not really alive, okay? That's the problem. We were, we were dead. We were dead before our union with Christ. The new life that we are given in Christ begins on earth, and it continues through eternity. It's an eternal life. It begins here, and it continues throughout eternity. It's eternal life. Sometimes we miss that, but... This is a new quality of life. We have a new life because of Christ. Eternal life is not only a quantity of life, right? It's also a quality of life. Those of us who believe upon Jesus Christ will certainly spend eternity with our, you know, with the Savior, with our Savior. But in the meantime, on earth, our lives are being transformed by grace through faith. As believers, we are transformed from the death of sin to the life of Christ. We move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God. The things which used to move us no longer move us. Our thoughts and actions begin to move in the direction of God's will and not ours alone. As we progress in our walk with God, we grow in grace, knowledge, and effectiveness for Christ's kingdom, in which there is satisfaction, joy, peace, and justice. So this is sanctification, or what's commonly known as progressive sanctification. So I say, look at Philippians 2 and Romans 6, if you want more on that. So we're given a new quality of life. We're beginning to live for God's will and not just ours alone. And we're not perfect in this, obviously, but this is, this is, the, this is the direction of our life. Christ himself said, now this is eternal life that you know the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's the high priestly prayer from John 17. That's verse 3. He's referring to God there. From this text, we can see that eternal life begins on earth and extends through eternity. By grace, we who believe upon Christ experience unspeakable joy and true serenity as we walk with Christ throughout the years. The same Christ who saved us, satisfies us, forgives us, reminds and reminds us that he will never leave us nor condemn us. We are his, and he is ours through faith. In all of our struggles, he is there to guide us and comfort us and to lead us down the narrow path of salvation. Not one step of our spiritual journey is taken apart from his preserving goodness. When we do stumble and fall, he picks us up and places us back on our feet with renewed vigor and conviction. Those of us who persevere in the faith, right, we will spend eternity with Christ Jesus. That Christ, that which Christ began on us on earth will be completed in eternity. We will be given renewed bodies and minds which are untainted by corruption and earthly weaknesses. We will be glorified. It's not that we become gods, but we will be glorified. We'll have this sin. We'll have this dysfunction removed from us. We're taken away. We'll be perfected. Dysfunction and pain will be no more. We will bask in the presence of the maker and creator of all. There we will experience infinite joy and an unending peace, the likes of which no one on earth has ever imagined. We will fully know God and spend eternity delighting in his goodness. Here's a scripture quote. 
You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16. So let me summarize this up and then I got an application. It's here. Give me a couple more minutes, guys. And I do see people watching, so I'll hide your little watchers. So much more can be said on the topic of salvation, obviously, right? Books and books and books have been written. But for now, let me summarize what's been discussed. Because this is meant to be read and reread and um, you know, gone over a few times to understand everything. Basically, mankind has a sin problem and needs a sinless savior. Jesus Christ is that savior. The biblical Jesus Christ is that savior. Sin is death, but Christ is life. All who are saved are saved through the gift of God's grace. Salvation can never be earned. We do not deserve salvation. Because grace is a gift, it must be received through faith. Like grace, faith is also a gift. By sending Christ to die in our sins, God displays his wrath and our unworthiness. Upon the cross, Christ died in our place. The punishment that we deserve because of our sins fell upon Christ. Sorry, I was responding to somebody. Through faith, our sins are transferred to Christ and his unrighteousness is transferred to us. Through the death and resurrection of Christ, we can be friends of God, not enemies. Eternal life is a quality of life which begins on earth and is perfected in eternity. So please feel free to rewatch these videos. It's throwing a lot of content at you guys, but there's a lot of content that needs to be thrown. So let me give you guys a quick application here. I'm going to sum it all up. And this is a quick little verse for that. Acts 16.30b. What must I do to be saved? So first off, let me talk to the believer. So if you're a believer and you're and you're hearing this, I urge you to continue in your faith, right? Continue in the biblical faith. Remain in the biblical Jesus Christ. Keep pursuing God's perfect will for your life. Pass the message of this lecture, pass the gospel on to the next person and advance God's kingdom. Romans 10, 14 says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Right? So pass these things on. Pass these things on to the next guy. So this is not only our duty in Christ. It's also our greatest privilege. Now to the, the non-believer. If you do not believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and I invite you to make peace with God. Every word I've said here applies to you. You are a sinner. You have violated God's moral law countless times. You might not like hearing this, but it's true. You, like me, are a sinner. You, like me, are a sinner. Just like me, you need a Savior. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is that Savior. Jesus Christ, the biblical Jesus Christ is that Savior. The biblical Jesus Christ is the only hope for mankind. Without him, we are all under the just wrath of God and the death of sin. If you will turn to Christ, he will turn to you. He will welcome you in. He will forgive you and make you his own. And you will be given a new life, a new quality of life, and a new quantity of life for eternity. If you deny him, he will deny you. It's simple. You will remain under the wrath of God and the death of sin. The choice is yours. Choose life in Christ or death in sin. So if you want the life that Christ offers, you want a new quality of life, a new quantity of life, you want your sins removed, you want to become a friend to God, I would recommend taking these following biblical steps. One, admit and confess that you are a hopelessly lost sinner who could not stop breaking God's moral law. Okay, that's 1 John 1, 9. 
Two, believe upon Jesus Christ as your only hope for life and salvation. That's Acts 16.31. Three, turn to him and lay your life upon his mercy. Four, trust in him and learn to rely upon him for all your wants and needs. And after this, I recommend that you always, A, remember that you are a sinner by nature and that you need Christ for every breath. B, read the Bible, pray, pursue God's will over yours. C, seek out a church where you can find like-minded individuals, find a fellowship, find a group where you can find like-minded individuals who will help you and encourage you in your walk with Christ. And D, pass this message on to a new person. Pass this message on to the next person. So this is a lifelong process, but it can begin today. Today is the day of salvation. So make your peace with God before it's too late. Surrender to him and his irresistible love. And the final quote, Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So, like I said, I just wanted to uh, spend some time going over the biblical gospel because we are warned not to wander off into other gospels. We are warned to not wander off into believing in false Jesuses or these other Christs that people want to put forward. Um, what really are antichrists, if you want to use that term, they're, they're antichrists in that sense. Um, and Paul reminds us, you know, to remain faithful, to remain true in the faith, remain true to what the Bible teaches. There's a lot of, lot of stuff out there, but we are encouraged, we are told in the Bible to remain true to the Christ of the Bible, remain true to the God of the Bible. It's going to be a lot of temptation. It's going to be like a lot of other what might seem like options, but those are false options. Those are fake options. Salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone, in the biblical Jesus Christ, through the biblical God, and he has taught us grace through faith. Not works, not church membership and all that kind of stuff, but salvation by grace through faith in the biblical Jesus Christ alone. So I wanted to get that out there. I've been meaning to... Uh, I've been meaning to do this for a while now, but I've been lagging uh, and I had some time tonight. So with that, I'm going to sign off and go play some video games or watch some. I love you guys. Have a good night.